A couple weeks ago, Pastor Dave spoke on winning the spiritual battle. And as he mentioned to me that theme, and then Joey spoke last week in kind of a revelatory kind of way on the strength of God and our weakness, I felt like the Lord wanted me to kind of come on this idea of talking about spiritual warfare. So there are notes out there if you would like. Uh, they're this size. They're back in the back. If you want one, raise your hand up. Usher will get you one of those. If you need a pen, just reach over into the purse next year, whoever it is, and just see if you can find a No, don't do that. But uh, the title of this morning is Armed and Dangerous. Everybody say Armed and Dangerous. Armed and Dangerous. And we are. Sometimes we don't know we are, but we are. And knowing what God has done in us and for us, if you need notes, raise your hand up, is significant. So thank you, Tara, for praying for me. I love Tara. Everybody needs a Tara in their life. Is that right, Bradley? Amen. It's true. Everybody needs someone who believes in you and will listen. We're looking for notes. And will listen to you even when you, make, you don't make sense. Everyone needs someone like and Tara is that person. So let's read some passages. You've got them on your notes, and we're going to read these two passages, and then we'll kind of interface them a little bit, trying to use the Old Testament picture to show the New Testament truth. So 2 Samuel 23, verse 8 through 10, you can follow along. These are the names of David's mighty warriors, or as one of my pastor friends, Pastor Fred says, MMOG. Mighty men of God, MMOG. Joshi, ah, whatever, Joshi the Tehekamite was chief of the three. He raised his spear against 800 men whom he killed in one encounter. Next to him was Eliezer, son of Dodai the Ahohite. As one of the three mighty warriors, and he's who we're focusing in on today, he was with David when they taunted the Philistines, and this is 2 Samuel 23, verse 8. He was with David when they taunted the Philistines that passed Ammon for battle. And that was some miles kind of towards the coast going um, east from Jerusalem. Then the Israelites retreated, but Eliezer stood his ground and struck down the Philistines till his hand grew tired and froze to the what? Sword. The Lord brought about a great victory that day. The troops returned to Eleazar and David, who was there too, but only to strip the dead. There's another kind of parallel passage about the mighty men in 1 Chronicles 11 that just gives a little wrinkle on what's happening here. <clears throat> So, on this one, let's see here. First Chronicles eleven twelve. Next to him was Eliezer of Dodai the Hohite, one of the three mighty men. He was with David at past Ammon when the Philistines <clears throat> gathered there for battle. At a place there was a field of barley. The troops fled from the Philistines, but they took their stand in the middle of the field. They defended it, and struck the Philistines down, and the Lord brought about a great victory. Philistines were a nation next to Israel that didn't believe in Yahweh, didn't believe in God. They had their own gods they worshipped, and they tried to conquer the Israelites and bring them under their religious and empire domain, and God wasn't having it. But God used the Philistines to show the Israelites, you got to trust me, and God uses these stories to encourage us. Amen? Amen? Now let's look over at Ephesians 6, verse 10, and we'll go through this. So kind of think about, kind of think about Eleazar and his battle dress, his sword, his helmet. He's there with David. They're surrounded by these guys. They've said, here we are in this field of beans. Think, kind of think about that as Paul writes this. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power, Ephesians 6.10. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes or wiles or ideas or 
settled plan towards you, and he has one. He's got a cheat sheet on my weaknesses. He knows them. He watches me. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything to stand, three times, he's making a point. Stand firm. Then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, the breastplate of righteousness in place, your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the... And praying the spirit on all kinds of occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all God's people. Man, what a picture. Paul's writing this stuff when he's in prison. And he's having this revelation from God when he's in a difficult spot. And he pulls back to these scenes of God using his warriors back in the OT and says, let me give you a little picture here that's going on. So when we fight battles, and we all fight them, and at, at some points, I think we just get tired. Don't think. I think we think, gosh, hasn't this gone on long enough? Haven't we, haven't, hasn't this thing, just my job that's so challenging, or this physical thing I'm dealing with, or this, this systemic thing in our family, it seems like we keep bumping up against, and you just get tired. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah. And I think that's what the Lord was trying to speak this morning, Sherry, was the fact that he's overcoming and giving us strength even in the midst of it. And I've got to thank Eliezer when they're coming on to the Philistines and they got this, this ruckus going on and all the Israelite guys that are around David and uh, Eliezer are like, ah, it's too much for me. I'm too tired. I've had too much. I've... Yeah, I'll do the Sunday morning 90-minute thing, but nah, not every day, not today. i am got a hangover, man. It's a tough day. I'm having a hard time. I'm out of here. So all the guys go. But Eliezer says, you know what? These guys have been beating on us for years. They've been working us for years. It's about time to just stand. Do you remember the, the part in Lord of the Rings where, um, not Gandalf, big guy, strong guy, um, ranger dude, um, Aragorn. Yeah, he says, it may be someday that we lose, but not today. That's the idea. Can you say that again, young lady? But not today. Not today. Let's all say it. But not today. And that's the truth of it. So Eliezer said, it might as well be here, and it might as well be now. And that's what impresses me about this guy, is everybody else is out. Everybody else is bailing. He's like, nah, no, no. David stays. Eliezer stays. And they fight these guys. Now, I don't think that it is one of those where they took no shots. I think they took shots. I don't think you battle hundreds of things, people, and not take shots. I don't think you can walk a Christian life and not take shots, right? Heard something recently about the American jets around the world, and they showed pictures of these American jets, and they contrasted them to Russian jets and Chinese jets. And with the Russian jets and the Chinese jets, pristine, clean, perfect. 
ready for the parades, ready for the air shows, ready to show everybody the greatest planes they have. And the American jets, dirty. Got gas stains on them, have all this stuff, bugs on the windshields. They've got all this. And they said, here's the difference. American jets are flying all the time. All the time. The other ones, sorry to get a little political. They seem to be a little bit more for show at some points. I had a classmate in Bible college that got a brand new Bible. And the first thing he did when he got his brand new Bible was he put it on the ground and he drove his car over it. And then he brought it to class. I said, bro, what are you, what's up? He says, well, I didn't want anyone to think I wasn't reading it. Come on, bro. You're hurting me. You get where I'm going? Just, just let them wear out on their own. So Eliezer's out there, and he and David are taking shot, but that's why we like them. It's because they've been through the stuff, right? It always concerns me a little bit when I talk to people that are married to say, how are you? Well, we've just never had a fight. I'm like, what planet are you living on? And who did you marry? It's not that you're never going to have conflict. It's that you're going to go back and get it right. Correct? Hey, I'm sorry. I'm just being a jerk. I know. But... Can you find it in your heart to maybe forgive me again? Yes. Just give me a moment. It's kind of hard. I tell people um, where I work and people I talk to, and you know, people, you have folks coming in. I had a couple come in recently. How long have you been married? 60 years. How is it? Well, Reese looked at my name badge. The first 50 were the hardest. <laughs> Fair enough. What I get to look forward to. Yeah. It's not to say in our marriages, it's not to say in our jobs, it's not to say in our financial challenges that we don't take shots. It is to say that we don't give up. And it is to say today, if you hear his voice, listen to him and obey. One thing I've found recently in my life is if I get a little revelation from God that says, go talk to that person or write that text or write that email, I try and stop and do it right then because I have a tendency now at 41, 41? What am I? That's our son. That's right. That's our son. I have a tendency at the age that Paul McCartney said, will you still love me? Will you still feed me? When I'm... To forget what, I, what God said to me. So it's easier for me when I hear something to just do it today, right now. And it's better for me. If at the end of the day, wouldn't this be great? If at the end of the day we did what we know the Lord told us to do, and we put our head on our pillows thinking, I obeyed him? Isn't that the best feeling of all? And it might just be a little thing. It might just be a little thing. But I've done those little things before, and someone comes back and says, I cannot believe you sent that text right then. I, I can't believe that. I needed that right then. can't believe it. I do these little ditty things on Facebook, and they're kind of funny and, and whatever, and... Um, but they have some spiritual stuff to them. And people will push back on that and say, I cannot believe that was what I needed to hear right then. And I know who's orchestrating all that. I know who's doing it. It's God. So he stopped at that point. Here's your first fill-in. Whenever you battle the enemy, do so in the mighty power of the king. Don't battle in your own stuff. Don't, your, your own stuff isn't enough. Your stuff, I mean, you've heard it. The seven sons of Sceva, they're trying to dive, drive out demons in the name of Jesus, whom Paul speaks, not a lot of authority there, in, in, the, in the power that this guy's preaching on. That's what we're going to do. 
Jesus I know. Paul I know about. But who are you? And he jumps on him and beats him up and sends them all naked from the house. Not a real good spiritual experience. When you battle the enemy, you want to do so in the mighty power of the king. Amen? Amen. Romans 8.37 says that God has made us more than through him who loved us. 1 John 4.4, 4, greater is he that's within than he that's That's right. So when I come to the fight, when I'm ready to do the rumble, when I've got my moment, I don't want to stand in my degrees. I don't want to stand in a license. I don't want to stand in what my mom and my dog think about me. It's always good. Dog's gone, but still loves me from the grave. I want to stand in the power and the authority of the resurrected king is resurrecting me. Amen? I want that to be how I stand. And the enemy can sense that stuff. Number two, <clears throat> on your fill-in, when you battle the enemy, make sure you put on the full armor of God. Put on the full armor of God. One of my favorite preachers, I love him, Greg Laurie, uh, Harvest Christian Fellowship down in Riverside. And I remember getting one of these magazines that, that he did a sermon on this in there. And he began, I began to see that it was more than just this kind of nice little passage, that there were actual things that God gives us to armor ourselves up with these, not six, but seven pieces of armor. So let me show you what I do. And I do it daily. And the breakfast church, wasn't anyone do breakfast church this morning? Was that great? That was great. It was wonderful. I mean, you come to church, they feed you, they take your stuff away, they smile, their teeth are brushed, their breath is good. It's an amazing thing. And you get this sermon like in a concise kind of way. What's not to like? If you're like, I can't make the 1030. I think I'll go at 8. I think I'll go and I'll have breakfast with my friends. It's awesome. So we did this together this morning. But here's what I do every day. Lord, I put on the belt of truth. You're the truth of my life. Jesus is the way the, and the life. I put on the belt of truth that holds all these pieces together. Lord, I put on the breastplate of righteousness. I'm justified by what you did on the cross, not by what I do. Lord, I put on the helmet of? Lord, cover me with your thoughts. Your word says you've given me the mind of Christ. Lord, I put on, and I try and touch these to kind of make the connection. So I'm kind of, come on, Reese, we're going, we're facing another day. Lord, I put on the the gospel of peace. Wherever I go today, help me to have the courage to bring the gospel to my job, to my friends, to the gas station guy that's at five stinking dollars a gallon. Give me your attitude, right, where I go that I'm taking the grace of God there. Help me, Lord, to take up the shield of which I can extinguish fiery darts of the enemy John 8, your father is a liar, he said to the religious folks, and the father of all lies. When he lies, he speaks his native language. If you ever hear the devil speak, he lied to you. Well, it was kind of, what is that? Well, it was kind of a half-truth. That's a lie. It was, it was kind of good. He said it would feel good when I did it. That's true. But he didn't tell me about how I'd feel afterwards. That's true also. Adam and Eve and Reese. I remember when um, uh, Barb Cook, when, or Barb Cook or uh, Joan Sanford was speaking one time on this at East Hill. And she said, you know, we have a tendency to take the shield down and just look at what it would be like like if we weren't walking with God and had faith in him. And you know what happens when you take your shield down? 
and you're right there. You've taken shots you didn't need to take. I didn't need to take that shot. She's the only woman for me ever. God doesn't have the females to satisfy me. He has a fee mayo to satisfy me right there. And guys, that has helped me. The truth of the fact that God has given one woman to meet my needs intimately sexually keeps my mind in a much better place than saying half the planet is going to meet my needs. No, 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 just one. Right there, right there. Everyone say, go Judy. <laughs> Amen. Amen. So keeping that... Keep, that was all free, that last one. That was all free. But if you... No, that was all free. Um, but keeping the, the shield of faith up there keeps me... And, and how big was that shield of faith? What do you think? What do you think, you theologian, theologian brothers? What do you think? Yeah, four feet? Yeah, I mean, it, I mean, this thing, this wasn't one of these little deals. This was the big one that, like, if you keep it right, it protects you big time. So that was that. Uh, Lord, take up the shield of faith. Lord, I take up the sword of the... So I'm praying, Lord, help me to use your word today. I love when you have a song that's a popular song and a conversation presents itself and you're able to put the song in there. Do you ever do that? I did it this morning. Brandy, you're a fine girl. We were praying for a brandy. And I'm like, God, oh, I heard that song. And it kind of gets in there. I'll tell you what's better than that. When you have a conversation and the Holy Spirit brings the word of God to you and you slip the word of God in there. You don't even have to put the chapter and verse. You just get it in there. People walk away that are non-believers are like, I cannot believe that conversation. What happened? Well, I, I was just talking, and then that guy said something. I, I just felt like something just, just grabbed me. What did he say? I don't know. It, I don't know. Something about God brings freedom. God brings, you know, where his, I guess where God is, he brings freedom. But it was like, wow. And that's, I think, how that sword thing is supposed to be used as we bring it in to conversations, but also to prayer, also to our job, we bring it in, and God uses that. He cuts through the darkness and brings light. And then the last thing he says, and pray in the Spirit how often? All the time, with all kinds of prayers and requests. So when you battle the enemy, do so in the mighty power of the king. Number two, do so with your armor on and in place, and usable. When Eleazar was there on the field and they came back to check it out and see, oh my goodness, I thought you guys would be dead and you're both still here. And I guess we get to take all the Rolex watches and stuff from all the Philistines that are here. Great. Get his cell phone. That's a good one. That's a, that's a good cell phone. Don't get the Apple. Get the Android one. That's what you want. Evil empire, right? Okay, anyway. But then they say, what's up with you? Eliezer says, well, I got this little problem. I, I guess I used this sword so much that I can't get my hand off the word of God. I can't, I can't fight without this thing. Come on, don't drive over your Bible. Use your Bible. Come on. I heard one guy say, it's not how many times you get through the Bible. It's how many times the Bible gets through you. Sometimes when you read through Scripture, it's like coming on an old friend and you find this promise you've had and you're like, I remember. I needed to hear that today, right now. I needed that. I think that's one of the reasons there's 31 Proverbs. Personally, I mean, there's, it's, even if I miss a day and I come on to like seven or eight and I'm like, I needed to hear that. So, I, How did you? Oh, you're God. You know everything. You're outside of time. I get it. Well, not really, but I get it what you just did. Yeah, the word of God is intended 
to be something, not only does it build us up and give us an inheritance among those who are being saved, Acts 20, but it gives us a weapon that we can use to keep ourselves free, to keep our family free, keep our friends free, and to stay free ourselves. Come on. It is a two-edged sword, and it goes both ways. Third thing, fill in. When you battle the enemy, stand your ground. I had a friend that was going through a tearing divorce. You ever been through one of those? Oh, gosh. I mean, you, it's tough to get in the middle of those with a friend or family member. Do you know what I'm talking about? Oh. One time I'm on with a family member, and I'm trying to advocate for the other side, and I heard this, you're either for me or against me. And I'm like, I think you're quoting that one out of context a little bit, bro. But man, it's like, geesh, blown up. So a friend of mine was going through one of these, and it was hard. And he said, you know, I feel like the Lord said, if I just give it to him, he'll work it all out. And, and I won't have to like fight the legal stuff to kind of get what's fair and mine and all that. I, I, and it, and, and it, there are grounds to do this and it's all good. But nevertheless, you get in there and you kind of feel like you're being dissed or whatever. And, and I got to get mine. So I heard him say this to me. And then I kind of watched him through the next couple months kind of go back and forth between, yeah, I'm kind of owed that or that's mine and, and all of this and kind of losing perspective on what he felt the Lord had said to him. But in the final analysis, he came back to that word from the Lord and trusted that God would do what God said he would do. And did God do it? Every time. If you heard God speak... He's speaking the truth every time. One of the ways we know God is speaking is because it lines up here. Yes, I will. God is faithful every time. That's why sometimes when you hear a word from the Lord, it can change everything in your life in a moment. Because God just downloaded something and it adjusts me where I needed to be adjusted and I'm good to go. I don't necessarily know if I need another sermon, but I need to hear something from God in the sermon. Catch what I'm saying? I don't necessarily know if I need another Christian book or song to sing, but I need to hear God in that song for what I face today. I need a word from God for what I'm facing right now that nobody else knows I'm dealing with, but I need it, and that's why I hold on to the word of God. That's the kind of stuff that when we step up and we face the enemy in the authority and the power of the king and the stuff that we put on the Kevlar, the armor, the armor of God, that allows us, number three, to stand our ground. Having done everything, he says, to stand. You know, with what's going on in our country right now, and in the world, in the confusion about gender roles, in the confusion about unborn life, and in the confusion about justice, I'll tell you, at some points, somebody's got to stop at some point and say, I'm going to stand right now, and with me, this stops right here. Do you hear what I'm saying? I've had enough of that. I've had enough of the enemy getting up in my face about this. I'm going to stop right now and take a stand. I remember when a friend of mine who, in her days before Christ, had believed the lie that unborn children were not children and had aborted four of her kids. And I remember how that just dogged her. It just, no matter where she went, and, and she was rising in leadership and a wonderful leader, but I remember how it just dogged her. And then one day, 
she stopped and she said, you know what? If God forgave all my sins, how many people have had Jesus forgive all your sins? How many people have had that? If God forgave all my sins through Christ, then he forgave me for those abortions. I need to not call God's unforgiveness ineffective, and I need to forgive myself for having done that. Clear conscience. And you know what? She got free. She got free of that whole thing. She was able to stand with the ground being there, and now she's an advocate for those who are caught in crisis pregnancies. It's just amazing. And then, as it to add victory to victory, she begins to understand, oh, if this child wasn't born or was stillborn or was aborted, that child goes to heaven, and I'm going to see my kids. Lord, help me to know, well, I'll give you the names of those kids. If you'll just listen, and they will find you when you come to heaven. I mean, it's just amazing. But she was dogged for years, like you and I have been dogged for years by things we've done that Jesus has forgiven us for, but the enemy continues to throw them. What do we call that? We call that a fiery dart. Yeah, an arrow. Got to get my shield of faith up there to put down those lies of the enemy. So here's your fill-in, and this is maybe the big one for the day. Where do you need to stand your ground? Where is God calling and saying, bro, sis, dude, dudette? Where is that place that, you know what, I know, Reese, I need to stand here. Or this promise, or for my daughter, or for that guy at work, or for that inequity thing that happened that's still not right. Or for my president, daily, in prayer as the Bible says to do. I need to stand. And I'll tell you this, like Eliezer and like David, when you begin to stand like that, you'll begin to make a difference. Here's one of the ways I stand. When I'm coming into work, Lord, I'm coming in Jesus' name today. I'm taking this step in Jesus' name. Give me your heart as I'm coming into work today. I try and do that daily so that I'm not working for the job. I'm working for the king. Happen to get paid through the job. Amen? Amen. I'm, trying to, I'm trying to work it into my life so those pieces of armor become part and parcel of who I am. I did this with the uh, breakfast church this morning. Did you ever walk into a room or a place, and you just feel like there's something not right here? You ever do that? I think that's your spiritual spidey sense going on, saying there's something here that you need to take care of. And I think the enemy leads, I think the enemy leads with fear. And he tries to throw those things up in front of us so we'll like back off. Where God would say, oh, no, no, listen to that. This is something you want to respond to. And now my spidey, my elephant ears are on. And I'm now like, okay, I wonder what's up here because the enemy's trying to get me off task. He knows I'm in the room. What's going on? And it's amazing how the enemy overplays his hand every time. And if we can just be in there and be sensitive to what the Lord's praying, saying and pray in the spirit how God can use us. So can you stand with me? And let's pray, shall we? Worship team, you can come up. That'd be great. Thank you. Folks, you've got to see yourself the way God sees you. He doesn't see you as some weak little person that's just barely making it. He doesn't see freedom as this, this church is just trying to hold itself together. He sees this as a vibrant faith-filled, spirit-led, armored up, armed and dangerous family of believers. Amen.